Good morning. It's great to be here. It's been such a joy. Yesterday was such a joy for me. I got to hang out with these students, most of them in uh, theology or around there, and uh, Bith, I learned that word yesterday. And uh, they, their questions were amazing. You guys asked great questions. And then I hung out with faculty, and then I was like ready to move here and try to make these people my best friends. So it was just a joy. And um, it's gonna be really awkward because I have people behind me today, but maybe I'll just like, I'll just switch. But anyway, let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we need you, Lord, and we love you. Amen. All right. So, um, this morning, we continue to talk about Martha and Mary, and I want uh, to take a, a bit of a different take this morning on the story. And one of the great things about story is that it holds re- a lot of different facets, that there's a lot that we can draw from one story. There's never a single implication of, of a passage or of the gospel itself. And so, um, we're gonna look the same story this morning and draw kind of more out of it. So uh, this phrase, Martha was busy with much service. The term busy there in Greek is also, Martha was distracted with much service. Martha was distracted. So I'm going to kind of land on that term and talk about what distracts us today. So as I was thinking about this passage, a particular image kept coming to my mind. And uh, I thought about having an artist or someone here try to draw it. And, and maybe that's something that you Wheaton artist can work on this week, can play with this and draw this or sketch this or paint this. And then if so, share it with me. But um, because I didn't have time to do that, I had my buddy Trent alter a historic painting for us. So if they could bring it up. So this is uh, George Frederick Stettner's Christ at the Home of Martha and Mary. And uh, I think it's from the 16th century, maybe 17th. So, but if you notice, um, those of you that can, you guys probably can't see it. Uh, What's in Martha's hand? Can you tell? It's a smartphone, yeah. And I don't know if you can see, but if, you, if it's really small, that's actually a cat video that she's watching. <laughs> so, which I, I, so I love this. Mar- Mary and Martha at Jesus, and Jesus is talking to Mary, and Martha's looking at a cat in the, in the cat video. And this is obviously, obviously anachronistic, I don't have to tell you that, but I think imaginatively, this is the picture that kept coming to mind, because if this took place now, the story took place now, Martha might not be distracted from Jesus with household activities, because there's honestly just fewer household activities to do. We have technology for that. But she would be distracted by what most of us are distracted by, what I'm distracted by. Martha represents to us dangers, not only of some kind of a false messiahship that we saw yesterday, that we talked about yesterday, but also the danger of the dissipation of our energies through distraction. And we live and love in an uh, age of unprecedented, unprecedented distraction. And my chief concern here is not if technology and social media are good or bad, because of course they're both, they can be used for both. Uh, but I also want to say that the new technology is not a neutral tool, but it's something that shapes us. It's something that works back on us to form us. Our use of technology forms us, it disciples us, it shapes us toward a certain end. And I'm 
primarily interested in talking today about how technology shapes us. So, how does it shape us? Here's some ways. One, I think new technology around the internet and social media in particular shapes and divides our attention. This is the definition of what distraction is, right? To have our attention divided. We are more capable of surface attention, that is of consuming small bite-sized bites of information about a lot of things, but less capable of depth attention, where we focus our attention on a substantive and involved argument, or even, even silence, experience silence, for long periods of time. Nicholas Carr, in his great book, The Shallows, says, once I was a scuba diver in a sea of words, now I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet ski. And I identify so deeply with that. Carr makes the point that taking in small snatches of information actually rewires our brain, something happens uh, neurologically, so that we actually lose capacity to follow long arguments and to maintain attention over time. And the implications of this on our spiritual life can hardly be overstated. Because good theology requires us to sit with a complex argument over time. And we're actually losing the neurological capability of doing that. The implications on our spiritual practices can hardly be overstated because giving sustained attention to the right things is, is a necessary part of discipleship. In fact, you could define discipleship as learning to give sustained attention to the correct things. Mary here is making, is taking a particular habit. She's taking up a particular habit of attention to the words of Jesus. And Martha is taking up a particular habit of distraction. Matthew Crawford, who's a philosopher and also a motorcycle mechanic, he's a brilliant guy, has written about what he calls a crisis of attention in our day. So how do we combat this crisis of attention? One, I would say, we combat distraction through formation. The Christian life, I've come to believe, is a craft as much as it is a set of beliefs. It is a set of beliefs, but it is also a craft that we take up. Habits and practices that shape our loves and our aims and our end, our telos. You are not going to cultivate attention to the work and words of Jesus simply by conjuring up in your heart more and more love for Jesus or greater and greater kind of emotional fervor. Andy Crouch, who I quoted, yesterday, I quoted this yesterday, but I wanna remind you, he said, to be of any use to the world in these difficult times, we have to practice the spiritual disciplines that make us different from the world. And a chief place we do this is in our use of technology. So I write in the book um, about this Linton experiment I did. So the way that I used to wake up in the morning is I would wake up and then next to my bed was my smartphone and I would grab my smartphone. And, uh, and I never made my bed, and I didn't realize that this was something grown-ups like, did. I thought that kind of, it was like algebra homework, like the second that you don't have to do it anymore, you just stop. And so uh, one year I just got curious if, I mean it just sort of occurred to me that there could be millions of people making their bed, and it never, I never realized that was a possibility. So I, um, I asked my friend Bree, hey, do you make your bed? And she said, yes, most of the time I do, but almost always at night, right before I get in it. And I was like, that it makes no sense at all. <laughs> that's crazy. You're about, because that's the reason I didn't do it, is like, you know, you know you're gonna sleep in that tonight, right? Like, there's things you have to do, like dishes that you have to do, because, you know, you don't have dishes otherwise, but a bed, you know, it's just, it, this feels like this Sisyphean task that you're always doing. So, 
Anyways, I've gone and t told this story, and my book has gone out. The, I, everywhere I meet now, I, there's these people that make their bed at night. I bet there's some here. I call you night makers now. Um, okay, so I decided, I took, this, I took this Facebook poll, and people had very strong opinions about making the bed. Some people were like, this is crazy, who has that kind of time? And some were like, I cannot believe, like, I'm not sure I trust you with my children if you don't make your bed. And it was very intense. And so I just decided, for Lent, I would give up my smartphone, uh, I would banish it from my bedroom. It was, and I would just take up the practice of making the bed. So every morning I would make the bed, and then I would sit on the bed for a few minutes um, of silence. I would just practice silence. And sometimes I would pray, um, but I would sit. I would just sit. And I would enter this embodied activity of, holding, of pulling up blankets, of standing on the floor, of noticing what's around me. And I would practice uh, quiet. And so I write in the book, the technology began through this practice of waking up with my cell phone. Technology began to fill any empty moment that I had in the day. Just before breakfast, I would check it. And then I would, if I was sitting at a red light, I would check it. If I could sneak in something after lunch, I would check it. I would check my s smartphone again right before I went to bed. It was just kind of a thing I kept going back to. And without realizing it, I had slowly built a habit without knowing it, without thinking about it. I had built the steady resistance to an even dread of boredom. And I didn't wake up every morning and begin my day by saying, I believe in Steve Jobs, maker of heaven and earth. I didn't quote a creed that the chief end of man is to enjoy technology forever. But the way that I walked through my day shaped my love, it shaped my desires. And I think Apple, often more than the church, knows that what, what we, the way that we live our lives, uh, the stuff we do with the actual moments in our day shapes who we are more than what we sort of claim to believe. So taking up this practice of bed making didn't radically change my life outwardly. I didn't move to Tibet. I didn't start a bed making nonprofit. I, but I was imprinted differently. I took up this very small practice that taught me to lean into silence a little bit more and to waiting. And it allowed me to approach the rest of my day, even really ordinary practices in a different light. I was living my life, without even thinking about it, towards an end of entertainment and constant connection and constant sort of taking it of information. And devotion to Jesus, for me, was not something I needed to kind of do in my mind and my heart mainly, but in approaching this pattern, this liturgy of my day differently. Andy Crouch, in his book, TechWise Family, I know I'm quoting Andy twice, but I love Andy. He says, the most powerful choices we will make in our lives are not about specific decisions, but about, the patterns, but about patterns of life, the nudges and disciplines that will shape all our other choices. What Martha does here, being distracted, what Martha does in <coughs> serving is not in and of itself a sinful act, but it shapes her attention to a certain end. She's embracing this pattern and habit of distraction. All right, so distraction. So second, our technology shapes us and forms us toward an end of abstraction. Social media has trained us to prioritize distant online relationships and deprioritize face-to-face embodied relationships. The particular temptation I think that we face in our moment of history right now is abstraction. To proclaim a love for the world while hating the actual people that we know. To proclaim a love for God, but not know how to embody that in the small moments of our actual day. We can have 2,000 followers on Twitter, or more or less, or Instagram, 
or whatever your thing is, but not have any close friends that really know us, not know the person who lives across the street from us or the people in our church. There's this um, Peanuts cartoon where Linus says, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand, which I totally identify with. So we can come to see uh, justice or peacemaking or seeking shalom as having all the right opinions and using the right hashtags, but not loving and serving the actual people on our block or in our dorm or our families. Even those people, I think especially those people who we think are wrong. So Marva Dunn, this is a useful concept, talks about this low information to action ratio. She gets this from Neil Postman. Low, she spells L-I-A-R, low information to action ratio, which basically means we have so much information now about so much that we can do so little about that we're actually formed towards an action. We're taught to take in information and not act on that information because we have so much information about things that we really can't act on. We live simultaneously in an age of overwhelming information about the needs of the world and also a hyperactivistic age where we're told that we must be constantly speaking truth to power through um, various forms of protest or boycotts or hashtagging. And I've participated in some of those and I'm not against that at all. But the unintentional consequence of this is that actually it's a kind of paralysis in which we do less and less other than kind of tell our opinions on Twitter while making more and more noise and generating kind of more and more heat and rancor and outrage about this problematic thing in our culture or that problematic thing in our culture. And those things are real and they are problematic. But we find ourselves in this way more and more isolated from the people actually around us more and more distant from the phrase I used yesterday, from the neighborhood of chaos that is around us, that God is calling us into. So how do we combat this abstraction? I'd like to submit that the hope that we are waiting for and, and yearning for and even celebrating in this time of Advent, the incarnation of Jesus dealt a death blow to any spirituality or practice that is abstracted. We do not serve a far off God. We serve a God that through the incarnation came into the concrete, took on skin, lived most of his life as an average guy. Jesus loved his actual neighbor who didn't think he was anyone that special for most of his life. He loved actual people with proper names. When people preach on this passage, Martha and Mary, they often draw a contrast between Mary and Martha. And that was my plan. That was when I first approached this, that's what I was going to do as well. But as I meditated and thought about this passage, the contrast that continuously struck me was not Mary's attention and Martha's distraction. But the contrast that began to ca capture my imagination was the difference between Jesus' attention and Martha's attention. After all, Jesus only had about three years of public ministry here on earth. And here he was in a house teaching a woman, a person with very little power, likely with very little education. If Martha was busy, Jesus had, was uh, had, at least had justification to be far more busy. He could have been preaching to the crowds, he could have been getting his message to as many people as possible, he could have been working on his public branding, he could have been healing the sick, there was a lot of sick people there, and every minute that he spent with Mary, people in the ancient Near East were not being healed of leprosy. They were not being delivered from an oppressive political system. They were not being rescued from, from literal death. Thinking of it this way, it seems like this moment in the life of Jesus is inefficient. It's not missional enough. We just got done hearing Jesus preach about the parable of the Good Samaritan 
And here Jesus, the Samaritan, is hanging out with Mary when there's oppressed people and hurting people in his city. There's this quote from the former Archbishop Michael Ramsey, who is an amazing, I love his writing. And it didn't make it in the book because I didn't read it until after I published the book, but it would have made it in the book because it's precisely what I was trying to say. And it's really long, but hang with me. So he says, Michael Ramsey says, the glory of Christianity is in its claim that small things really matter and that the small company, the very few, the one man, the one woman, the one child are of infinite worth to God. Let that be your inspiration. Consider our Lord himself. Amidst a vast world with its vast empires and vast events and tragedies, our Lord devoted himself to a small country, to small things, and to individual men and women, often giving hours of time to the very few or to the one man or, or woman. In a country where there were movements and causes which excited the allegiance of many, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Essenes, and others, our Lord gives many hours to one woman of Samaria, one Nicodemus, one Martha, one Mary, one Lazarus, one Simon Peter, for the infinite worth of the one is the key to the Christian understanding of the many. The infinite worth of the one is key to the Christian understanding of the many. To approach life this way, as if in attention to concrete things around us, as if the most important person to us is the person in front of us, is indeed a radical way to live in our moment of history in particular. The remarkable thing in this passage to me is that Jesus, that God himself, saw it worth his time to focus his attention on Mary. And she's wise enough to eat it up, to take all she can get. He was not one who embraced sort of abstract causes of the world, even the abstract causes that some of his disciples wanted to co-opt him into. But instead, he embraced people, real people. Wendell Berry, the poet agrarian uh, who I love, told a story about a person who came up to him after an event and said, um, this is how he tells it with this accent, so I'm gonna use it. He, sa she sa he says, Wendell, this lady, to him, I just love the environment. Don't you just love the environment? And he said, ma'am, the things we really love usually have proper names. And what he meant is that we can't love the environment. We love a particular place or block or hill or neighborhood or city. And in the same way, we can't love people abstractly. We love Marsha or Jim or Sarah or Tim. So what's this mean? for our life and for our sanctification. I think it means a lot of things. Here's one thing it could mean. The only place that I can love God and serve others is in the real and actual limited circumstance that I find myself in today, beginning with the people and places around me that have proper names. The hope that we celebrate in Advent reminds us that it is the concrete, not the abstract, that saves the world. Specifically, our concrete and real God in his concrete and real incarnation made a people, his church, who live our concrete and real lives in ways that he takes and through that makes all things new. God is working and he is working wonderfully in our concrete and limited and actual lives. And these small daily acts of formation, of prayer, of loving our neighbors, of attention, are what God uses to change the world. What we are called to is to love and serve him in our sphere that we find ourselves in today. And he takes that faithfulness and he will use it in ways that you cannot imagine. 
We are loved by God, and you are loved by God with your proper name, not as an abstraction, not as merely part of humanity, not as your ideal self that you think you should be. That is not who God loves. He loves you, the real and actual concrete limited you. He loves you by your proper name. That's how Jesus loved people. And it is out of that reality, that grounded, secure reality of belovedness, of your concrete, actual belovedness, that we are called to take up daily habits of attention to God as he gives attention back to you. And we are called out of that place of belovedness to take up practices of attention to those around us to the people and place we find ourselves in, to follow Jesus in the embodied and limited circumstances that we find ourselves in today, that he has placed you in today because he loves you and he knows you by name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.